Hey everybody, Portland Chess Shop here to bring you the chess action, and we have a battle between two international masters. This is Daniel Narditsky. He is a champion. He was the under-12 world champion. He's a from the United States, from the San Francisco Bay Area, and when he was uh, 11 years old, he went to Istanbul and won the whole um, world championships for his age group. So this is an excellent player. This is, you know, if Nakamura does, does not become world champion, I think th this guy is United States' uh, current best chance. So he's currently working on his Grandmaster Norms. Uh, I've actually spoken with him a few times uh, through email to see if he wanted to do a simultaneous exhibition in Portland. So he is playing Wilson Palencia, and that's probably his real name, from Venezuela. You can see that Daniel Narodinsky is a heavy favorite. This opening was a Karo Khan defense, which is normally you know, a somewhat passive game, but in the last game that Daniel Narodinsky played, it was it was really wild. There was some serious complications, and both players made so, some big weaknesses. Wait, so if uh, Bishop takes b4, then knight f3 is checkmate. So look at that move. That is just... Amazing. He plays b5. Now the queen's hanging and he's threatening this check, which isn't checkmate anymore because the king could come here, but it is a good tactic. Check, takes, and it takes the queen. And that's how Daniel Narodisky takes this guy down. All right, let's go through this game really quickly to see exactly how Daniel Narodisky beat this guy in 16 moves. So they played the Karo Khan defense, which I was starting to explain uh, is usually a passive opening it's like defensive you're just grinded out but i was saying that i know daniel narodinsky to be a very sharp attacking uh dynamic player so i was a little bit surprised that he was using this defense but i imagine that he might have some aggressive ideas in mind in w even when he plays this so e5 was played this is the advanced variation the bishop comes out and this is the main line of the advanced variation. Here, g4 is supposed to be played. And this is supposed to be a closed positional line in which uh, this bishop has to retreat. White is able to expand again. White gets a lot of expansion, but black gets a uh, French defense uh, or even a semi slav type position in which the bishop is outside of this pawn triangle. This pawn triangle is pretty good against a lo a, a numerous different openings especially when this pawn is on d4. So anyway, this bishop is outside of that diagonal, which means that this bishop is a good bishop instead of a bad bishop. So that's sort of the idea, is that black has to just defend and turtle uh, like the Terran, I guess, in order to... but has this sort of siege tank out on the perimeter that's controlling a lot of lines. And uh, white's able to play in this zerg fashion, expanding very rapidly, expanding with tempo on each turn, meaning that they're getting an expansion uh, and you're just like moving your piece again. So that's pretty good. So the bishop retreats and the knight comes out. This is possibly a deviation from the main main line. Uh, I think the knight could be thinking about going to f4 to trap the bishop. Daniel plays c5 immediately, not worrying about playing something like h6 to find room for this bishop, because really if he hunts down this bishop, it's going to take three turns to capture this piece, which has moved twice already. But pawn up, this is attacks the center, and this is sort of an attack on the sides, or the idea of an attack on the sides, and you attack the center in response to an attack on the sides. I wonder if that's true in StarCraft 2 as well. It is kind of, right? That's why at Zerg you put the hatch you put your hatchery to be the farthest on on your side of the base. Uh I mean like you take it if you're in one corner, you put it in a whole another corner so that if they send the army at that at that expansion, then you can go back and uh move your army into their main, right? Just send your Zerglings up their base and attack them and you'll be able to destroy their supply. So it's actually the same the same thing in in chess. It's kind of weird. So h4 is played uh, attacking this bishop. So now the bishop's going to have to create a little bit of room, probably play something like h6 in order to find some space, some breathing room for this siege tank. Knight c6 and h5 is played. So now the bishop is attacked. And the bishop, this is pretty interesting. 
It looked like the bishop's going to have to go to e4, after which the knight will be able to take it. So the, usually, usually you don't want to trade the bishop for a knight, but uh, Daniel is trading activity. He's now attacking the center with this move and with this move and attacking you know, his opponent's base. In or, he's trading activity, uh, time really, for, for the bishop. The bishop is captured and the knight is captured as well. So now we have a little bit of a different position uh, from the traditional Karakhan. The D file could open up and this square is attacked. If this, if anything moves here, then this square will be weak. And this pawn is an interesting pawn because it looks like eventually white could capture this pawn. But it's a question of does he have enough time and will he be able to maneuver around this pawn in the meantime? So C3 is played creating basically a pawn fence, a pawn chain, so that each pawn is defending the other. After which there's takes, takes, and bishop check. Now this move is a, is a good move. So it's checking the king, and you notice that the king actually doesn't have any squares. It's something interesting that this awkward knight move did to the position. So check, and it looks like bishop d2 is going to be like the only move, because you don't want to interpose with the queen. So you literally only have one move, which is bishop d2. And now you might think bishop, bishop a5, but it, I, this is the position, I believe, in which Daniel played a very aggressive move. Knight takes d4. No way. Check this out. Oh, so it's not, it's not sound, maybe. Takes, it looks like white is plus four. White has a huge advantage in this position. Wow. Wow. So it wasn't a sound play, even though it won immediately. I thought it was sound when I was watching it live, so this is quite surprising. So the, the line in which it's uh, refuted is knight takes, knight takes d4. And then if queen takes d4, there's going to be a queen a4 check, after which the king has to move. There's no pieces that can really block. And then the queen's going to capture this bishop on b4. And white is up a piece with a very good position. Interesting. So if Danya played it, played it really fast. Dan and Arditsky played it very fast. And this guy, I wonder how long he thought about it because he actually has a game-winning move. It was pretty scary because this knight check looks like mate but he just blundered with queen a4 after 10 seconds yeah so this was poor use of his time he had enough time this is a surprising move and when you see it i think you have to at least look for a refutation he did look for a refutation because he played queen a4 check but that move was definitely not sufficient so after this move white is screwed the only square the queen can retreat to is like a6 or d1. d1 doesn't work because this is mate. So here, he doesn't get mated immediately, but then queen takes bishop as mate still. So after check. So the queen is, is falling for sure. After queen takes b4, there's uh, knight c2 check. Checking the king and the queen. So you win the queen again. So a pretty exciting game. I hope you liked it. Until next time. Portland Chess Shop.